welcome to another episode of Access Ability. It's a show on YouTube where I talk about the video game industry, accessibility and representation. I'm your host, Laura. I'm a white woman with bright blue hair, shaved on one side, wearing a plain black dress. Most of the time, when I play a particularly tough video game, and I don't think I'm alone in this, I like to feel like, or at the very least pretend, that my success or failure is entirely down to my own level of skill and a little bit of luck, maybe, but I like to think that my skill is the determining factor going on in video games. I know that that's not strictly true, but I want to believe that my skill is really the only thing that's helping me to, you know, defeat whatever big challenge is in front of me. However, a lot more often than you probably realise, Video games will kind of fudge the numbers a little bit to make it seem like you're playing a little bit better than you actually are. These tricks are little lies that video games will tell you that go on behind the scenes. Sometimes they're advertised features, but usually they're subtly going on in the background to bring what you intended to do based on your button presses and what happens in screen a little more in line with each other. Basically put, if you press a button to do a jump in a video game and Technically, you've gone just one pixel off the edge, you should fall down. But you don't, sometimes. Sometimes you get to do that jump anyway. These are moments where the game developers want you to feel like your input had an effect on the game, and while a lot of these are done to make you enjoy games more and to make them feel less frustrating, a lot of them are also really useful as accessibility tools for disabled gamers. While many of these little tricks and small lies told by game developers go completely unnoticed by most people playing video games. Sometimes one of them will get discussed, sometimes by a game developer, sometimes by a player who finds a way to capture on video that one has happened, and you'll see them getting discussed a bit more by the public, and today I want to talk about one of those examples that people have been, this past week, pretty publicly talking about in a game. So today, on Access Ability, we're going to be talking about Kirby and the Forgotten Land. We're going to talk about some of the tricks and, I guess you could call them lies, that the game tells players in order to ease the transition from 2D gameplay to 3D gameplay. We're going to talk about some of the design considerations around that game and how that game makes itself more accessible by using these little lies to the player. And we're going to talk about some other games historically that have similarly done things to lie to the player to make their games more accessible, and how this sort of fits in compared to those other examples. Let's start off by talking about Kirby and the Forgotten Land and the tricks that it employs in order to remain accessible for 2D series fans. Kirby and the Forgotten Land is a 3D Kirby adventure, but much like Super Mario 3D World, it uses fixed camera angles to control how you view its 3D environments. While the player does have some limited camera control tied to the right analog stick, this gentle tilting is within strict limitations. For the most part, players will see Kirby's world from predetermined vantage points. Many of Kirby's signature copy abilities were designed with 2D level design in mind, and when moving to a 3D space, players who don't play many 3D action games will have to more carefully aim their attacks in three dimensions. While most copy abilities have a very wide hitbox and a wide range of area around Kirby that they will strike, the game also uses its forced perspective to lie just a little bit to the player about whether or not an attack has successfully hit its target. As you can see demonstrated in this footage on screen, if Kirby tries to attack an enemy and misses, but from the default fixed camera angle it looks like the attack hit, then the game will register it as a hit within a certain range. This doesn't in practice mean that you'll be hitting enemies miles away across the level accidentally in the background, but if an enemy is near enough that you probably could have hit it, and your attack was close enough to look like it connected with the enemy, rather than having it miss and the player be disappointed, it will register the hit to keep the gameplay feeling satisfying and lower frustration for the player. Since footage of this has started doing the rounds on Twitter, a lot of gamers have been complaining about it, saying that they don't want the game to lie to them, and that they would rather the attack simply miss should they, you know, not hit the target properly. And to them, I say that this has been happening in games for years. In some cases, things like this are literally sold to you as desirable mechanics, and 
you've likely not even thought about it before now. So, let's talk about some of the tricks that other video games already kind of use to lie to the player to make certain mechanics more accessible. Coyote Time, named after the classic Roadrunner cartoons, is a term colloquially used by video game developers to refer to an amount of time, usually measured in a matter of frames, where a character can technically have already stepped off of a ledge, but if the player presses the jump button, they will still execute a jump correctly as though they had done so with their feet still on the last platform. Many of the world's most satisfying to play platformers, including most of the Mario series titles, make use of this mechanic extensively. It's barely perceptible if you don't know that it's there, but it helps the game feel right, without needlessly punishing you over a matter of pixels you accidentally went slightly past the edge before you jumped. Kirby in the Forgotten Land does something similar to this, with jumps. Kirby has this mechanic where if you're in the air when you press the jump button, rather than doing a standard jump you will sort of hover at your current height. In practice, when you're playing Kirby and the Forgotten Land, because you're not playing from a 2D perspective, you don't always see precisely if you're on the floor yet, or if you're slightly above the floor because of isometric perspective. As a result, what this game does is, if you're about to touch the floor and you press the jump button, the game will treat it as if you'd touched the floor so you can do a full jump, even though it should, on paper, hover you very near the floor. It's the same kind of mechanic as Coyote Time, it is making sure that what you feel like should have happened, happens on screen, rather than the objective reality. Moving to other mechanics that you don't see in Kirby so much, a lot of first person shooters will have enemies deliberately miss their first couple of shots at you if you're looking away from them, so that you have a chance to know that they're present and sort of where they are, so that you can react and fight back, rather than being killed by an enemy you didn't know was imminently about to kill you. In games like Elden Ring, these kinds of player experience friendly lies are sometimes sold as features to be exploited by skilled players. Invincibility frames, sometimes known as iframes, are a window of time, usually during a dodge animation, in which your character becomes literally invulnerable to all damage. This allows players to survive otherwise fatal attacks, and to feel like it was due to their amazing skill, which, you know, it is. Dodging an Elden Ring only gives you a very limited number of invincibility frames, but that's still a window of frames where an attack is hitting you, and the game doesn't count it as damaging so that you can be cool and take down the big boss. In many games, including several competitive fighting games and RPGs, the last little sliver of your health actually represents a larger amount of health than it would otherwise appear to be. The same size chunk of your health bar going away might actually represent a larger or smaller amount of health depending on where in the health bar it comes from. Sometimes referred to as the magic pixel, this allows players to have the experience of feeling like they've clawed their way back to victory from defeat when they were impossibly close to death, by disguising how close to death the player actually was. Often you've got more health than it looks like, but deliberately the game will play around to make it look like you're on the cusp of death and somehow survived, so that you can feel cool. Some game series, such as the Borderlands games, will allow you to do extra damage when you're struggling, and won't tell you that you're doing that. If you get downed in Borderlands and manage to get back up and keep fighting, your character will for a brief time deal additional damage to help you win a fight that the game knows you were previously at risk of losing. The game will see that you got downed and you almost lost, and give you extra health to compensate and make a comeback. I bring up all of these non-Kirby examples today, not to go, aha, gotcha person watching this video, you're actually not good at playing games, they're all just lying to you, that's, that's not what this is about. I bring this up to say that video games have been doing this for years, the only thing that really makes Kirby different is that it's been made public knowledge that Kirby is doing this, but if you look at all the other things happening in this video, they're all things that once you know about them you can see pretty easily in a lot of the games you play. Kirby isn't some kind of outlier that is making itself needlessly easy and lying to the player because it's afraid of challenge. This is a thing that lots and lots of video games have done through most of the history of our medium. Video games lie to us constantly in order to make our experience of their worlds a smoother, more enjoyable experience, and I think that's completely okay. If you're a skilled enough player, a lot of these mechanics will never kick in for you, a lot of these are things that 
you will never encounter and therefore will never notice because you're, you know, jumping at the right time, you're never having to use coyote time, you're never getting knocked out, so you're never getting those health boosts. But if, like me, you are a disabled player who sometimes struggles with video games, a lot of these exist to basically make it so that if you finally manage to do a thing, if you finally manage to get your analog stick pointed toward that enemy and do that attack, and it looks like it hit, it hits. And maybe I didn't actually hit them, maybe my depth perception wasn't playing nice today or something like that, but it looked like I hit, and I got really excited, and the hit happened, and I never have to question how it happened, because it looks like it hit, so why would I question it? These are the kinds of really smart implementations of little bits of accessibility that mean that a wide range of people of different skill levels are able to engage with the same media and have a very similar experience without having to know that they're being catered to. I talked recently about Horizon Forbidden West and the fact that I didn't like the way it did its auto-assist because it sort of moved my arrows in the air after I'd fired them and it became very obvious the game was helping me to be good. Things like this in Kirby work because they are seamless. I don't see any of the times that this game is fudging the numbers to make my attack hit, because it's only hitting in times when it looks like it should hit. That's the kind of assistance that makes me as a disabled gamer not have to think about my disability while I'm playing, and that is a really magical experience. Kirby and the Forgotten Lands is not made a trivially easy game because of this. I played the game through on hard mode, I beat the final boss of hard mode yesterday, and it was a challenge. This game is difficult, but it also offers these little behind the scene tweaks that just make it a little easier without the average player ever noticing, and in my book, that's a win-win. 